I, I'm hoping I can be entertaining. I am a historian, so there's no promises on this. Um, the Children's of Winnipeg is rather interesting because I came to it in a very different way. Um, I came upon its records. I, as anyone who was interested in the history of Winnipeg, especially the social and cultural history, I knew something about this place. I even knew where it had been located. But it was in the course of working on a much larger project, a uh, history of Winnipeg during the interwar period. Um, that I thought, oh, it would be worthwhile to take a quick look at these records, you know, and I knew where they were in the provincial archives, where I spend seemingly half of my life. And as I started going through them, I, I recognized, and I went through the records that would be publicly available, the sort of things that anyone can walk in off the street, register as a researcher, and would have access to. But I also knew that there was another set of records that you needed a special research agreement to actually see. Uh, because it contains all sorts of detailed information, including health records. So you'll notice when I'm talking today, I don't mention a single name of any of the children who are served. And in the images that we do, thanks to Dave, that, we've, that we finally got up for you, aside from one press picture, uh, you won't see any pictures of the children. That would be a violation of my research agreement. I cannot use any of those names. I have to be very, very careful. Now, many of the people that I would be talking about have passed away, but they still have family and, and relatives, and so you have to be very, very careful in terms of confidentiality. Um, but the Children's Home of Winnipeg, the reason that I thought it would be something useful to look at is because everyone knew that the Children's Home of Winnipeg was the almost elite, the premier child care institution in all of in Winnipeg, and when I say Winnipeg, particularly from the 1880s until the 1920s, 1930s. When you say something is the premier institution in Winnipeg, you're saying it's the premier institution in all of Western Canada and Northwestern Ontario. Winnipeg was the center for business, for, of course, Winnipeg was the Chicago of the North, right? All rail lines out to the west went through Winnipeg. But because of the nature of the Canadian prairies and the, the scattered nature of the cities, Winnipeg has always been a place that's had more social service and more cultural uh, resources than it should have for a city its size. It is this dominant metropolitan center over a much larger area. And so in the course of, of thinking about the history of Winnipeg, I realized that in addition to all the work I'd been doing on the various ethnic groups, things like this, that I was really lacking material on how regular people, regular families were coping. The Children's Home of Winnipeg is unique. If you'd flip to the next slide. Whenever we think about poverty in Winnipeg or problems of the working class, if you know Winnipeg at all, you automatically think about the North End. It was always the foreign quarter. And you know, here I was going to blame all my technical problems. It was another Russian attack upon Ukrainians. Uh, but in this case, the foreign quarter of Winnipeg was people by people by last names like mine, uh, Slavic peoples, Jewish peoples, people from all over Eastern and Central Europe. And traditionally, the north end of Winnipeg has been viewed as sort of the, the place where all of Winnipeg's problems of poverty would be located. As I started reading the records of the Children's Home of Winnipeg, I realized, and I, I knew this as a historian, in addition to all of these people coming over from Central and Eastern Europe, actually the single largest immigrant group coming to Winnipeg were from the British Isles. I, that's probably not stunning to you folks, but if I was to say that, and I have said this to a Winnipeg audience, they go, oh, really? It's like only historians, because we read the census data, actually recognize this. And so a large part, if you go to the next slide, there's a, another image of North End Winnipeg, and this is what generations of Winnipeggers and even scholars of Winnipeg have assumed would be the picture and the face of poverty or, or difficulties for the working class, right? How do you cope with your existence? What's the correlation between this and some place that sounds like an orphanage? Because orphanages, for the most part, were not what we might think an orphanage is. We think about an orphanage as a place where children with no parents are placed. For the most part, most of the child care facilities in Winnipeg and most other places are actually temporary locations 
where children are for one period or other placed in care because one parent or another has passed away or there's some sort of crisis. In some cases, these folks, the, the children who live in the children's home of Winnipeg and other such institutions, in some cases, they truly are orphans. They have lost everyone. But for the vast majority, they're being placed into places like the children's home of Winnipeg and there's a whole assortment of other types of, of institutions. They're placed in there on a shorter term basis as their families deal with a crisis, an economic downturn, unemployment, ill health. Now remember, I'm talking about a period that really, for this work, runs from 1883 up until, in my case, up till the late 1930s. There is hardly any social safety net for people to rely upon. So institutions like this are really important. But I keep on coming back to this, I'm not talking about the North End. Instead, the Children's Home of Winnipeg is so unique, and I realized it could give me a different perspective. I, I've, have, I've done a lot of work on ethnic groups in Winnipeg over the years. And we don't always think about the British, those coming from the British Isles, as an ethnic group. You know, we sort of go, well, they're, they're British Canadians, and they're gonna easily become Anglo-Canadians, right? They just fit right in, part of the British Empire and all that. But the reality is that these folks are immigrants. And the vast majority, of people who came over from the British Isles were working class in one way or other. And what's unique about the Children's Home of Winnipeg was it was founded by the Christian Women's Union in 1883. This was a non-denominational but very, very Protestant group. And because virtually every group in major cities would have their own care facilities to look after their own, if you will, this institution, the Children's Home of Winnipeg, which is going to become the largest in all of Western Canada, actually serves this population of British and British Canadian and Canadian-born folks as they go through crises and need a place for their children to go. And so it actually gives you a unique perspective. Now, I'm really talking today about, in some ways, the practices of a historian. First of all, I have to admit, I sort of Yes, I knew the published reports and everything would be of some importance, but what I didn't recognize was once I gained access to the internal cover files, that I would have access to a, a source of data that a social and cultural historian can only dream about. Particularly for this group, who I think are actually understudied in Western Canada and in Winnipeg in particular, the English or British Canadian. Now, if we can go to the next slide. The group of people, well, sorry, once again, this is just the, the importance of immigration. This is from 1884, right? Just part of one of Winnipeg's boom years in terms of, of growth. Uh, 80, 1881 to 1883, early 84, the railway is being built into Winnipeg and it's growing like topsy. Go to the next slide. This is what the immigration hall looks like 1900. And it's about to be torn down and as I didn't bring you a picture of it, it's gonna be replaced by a building that is eight stories high. Winnipeg is the center of all immigration, right? But for all of these groups. Now, if we go to the next slide, this is a map of Winnipeg, and this might be disconcerting for, for some of you uh, because it's not the traditional north-south orientation, right? Rather, it's, it's east-west. This, though, you folks would recognize, this is the Red River running through it. Same river that we have, just a little bit bigger in Winnipeg. Um, but one of the unique features of Winnipeg is right here. That's not a river dividing the city. That's the dividing line north and south. That's the railway marshalling yards and the tracks. You know the old expression, you come from the wrong side of the tracks? In Winnipeg, they mean it literally. Um, it's literally cut off. But Throughout the rest of Winnipeg, now this is heavily Eastern and Central European, the new immigrant groups, but there are pockets of English Canadian workers, particularly closer to the rail shops where many of the skilled workers would live. But scattered around the rest of Winnipeg, in places like St. James, Fort Rouge, the west end of Winnipeg, there's large concentrations of workers. The vast majority of people in Winnipeg are working class, right? And so they come from all over. And the groups served, the people served by the Children's Home of Winnipeg come from all of those areas, not just from the North End. In fact, a minority 
of the children who are in that and the family served have any tie into the north end of Winnipeg. Once again, because we're dealing with a period, and this is one of the other things that's really important to me in my work, is that we're looking at a period when we're going to see a switchover from charity work and what I refer to as the relations of rescue. Right? The relations of rescue is all about helping the poor, those who are disadvantaged. In this case, focusing upon the children. But this is done, for the most part, beginning this, at the beginning of this period, it's done almost strictly on a private charitable basis. But as I move along in time, I can note several different periods when all of a sudden there's going to be more legislation brought in, where there's going to be changes in social attitudes about the housing and care of children, about how much education they should give. Uh, when I look at the very first records of the Children's Home of Winnipeg from 1883 and up into the 1880s and 1890s, the attitude is, oh, if the older children that we serve, if they can get a grade five education, we've done our job. By the time I get up into the 1920s, the attitude is everyone should be going to school until 14, if they can. But I have to point out to you, Manitoba, the province that's, that surrounds Winnipeg, had no compulsory education law until the First World War. It was a matter of considerable debate whether or not you should have this or not, right? Because many groups didn't want to have compulsory education because they felt that it would impinge upon their family's ability to have children working and help to support the family. Uh, it was also seen as if you had compulsory education, who's, and if you know anything about Manitoba history, this is a crucial question, who controls education? Will it be a secular public school system? And when I say secular, in Canada, I mean Protestant. Will it be a secular public school system? Or will it be denominational? Will it be run by the various religious groups? And of course, in Canadian history, as in US history, there's going to be real conflict over the nature of education and who gets to provide it. You know? So these are all important questions and changes that we see over time in the course of the work I've taken on. Now, so I've seen families from all of this territory coming together. Now, if we flip to the next map, or sorry, the next image, this is one of my favorite images of the Children's Home of Winnipeg. This is its fourth location. It had been founded, as I said, in 1883, and for those of you who want to entertain people at cocktail parties, uh, you can point out that the very first Children's Home of Winnipeg was nothing more than an adjunct to the Christian Women's Union set up a maternity hospital for unwed mothers. The children's home was designed primarily to look after these, these infants after they've been born, sort of like a neonatal unit. And the first place that they set up shop is actually the old Bannatine residence in Winnipeg. I'd love to show you a picture, but it's been destroyed and we don't have any classic pictures. It's also, the Bannatine home was also the first place, he was a leading merchant and political figure, his home was the place where the first legislature of Manitoba met after the, after the creation of Manitoba in 1870. So that was a home that had m many, many purposes over the years. But they move from smaller locations to greater locations. They start out the first year, they serve maybe 30 people. By the time they get to this location, it's on River Avenue in Winnipeg. It's, uh, it's just off the downtown core nowadays, okay? By the time they get here, they can house over 100 children. However, because they've had to move into an already existing building and they keep on adding on to it and adding on to it, some parts of it, in fact, by 1903, this is a sort of a lovely looking building, there's gonna be one more little addition added to it. Parts of this building within five years are gonna be condemned. But they're gonna keep using it until 1915 when they can actually get a purpose-made building. Um, it's, they, they see so much dramatic change. Why? Because the city of Winnipeg is growing. And so the social problems are growing. Right, mentioned the founding year is 1883. Well, that coincides with the great railway boom. Well, Winnipeg then goes into a period of economic decline. Well, not really decline, but the boom ends, right? Uh, the West doesn't fill up in the Canadian case until the 1890s. And so the next big boom and a huge increase in population. Winnipeg goes from maybe 35,000 in the 1880s, and it had grown quickly to get to that point. But it's not gonna grow dramatically until we get to the late 1890s, when all of a sudden, all these immigrants 
from Great Britain, from Eastern Central Europe come in. Many of them on their way up further west to take up farms. The Canadian West was the last best west. After, you folks probably know Frederick Jackson Turner and the, the closing of the American frontier. Well, the Canadian frontier was just opening up. And so people are streaming in and people were being heavily recruited to come over. Of course, the more people you have, Winnipeg is going to increase by over 400% in two decades. Now, here's the other thing. Who are the people who are immigrating? Yes, I can, you know, we already know there's people from British Isles, people from Eastern Central Europe. But in age, who are the people most likely to immigrate? Younger people, right? Younger people who either already have children or are going to fairly soon. That means that we're going to see a number of crises related to rapid family growth. Now, as I looked at the records of the children's home, and I looked at the issues that were confronting these folks, I was still amazed by a number of particular features. To begin with, as I've mentioned, this children's home is drawing, particularly until the 1920s, it is drawing children, infants, yes, but they start focusing more and more on children, and changes in both legislation and belief about childcare is going to have the children's home focus, switch its focus of attention from brand new infants to otherwise neglected children, somewhat older children. Reason for that? Well, it became pretty apparent that children, infants in care died at a staggering rate. They had a much higher infant mortality rate than even in the poorer parts of the city itself. Children, infants in care were dying. We're going to get to the point, and I, I can't believe that I, I came across this piece of legislation. I'm going, really? In 1912, the provincial government passed a piece of legislation that said that no child could be given up for adoption until the mother had nursed that child for 10 months. Ufta. Now, there had been, as I say in Winnipeg, but there had been this change going on over the years about how you can keep infants safe. And it was clearly decided that a mother's milk and a mother's care was the best. But what do you do for these young women who are, especially because there's this huge problem of illegitimacy, right? Well, what do these women do? There are all sorts of natal units created in Winnipeg by different religious organizations, right, looking after their own. And almost all of them set up what they call a social service home right next door to the, to the maternity hospital. And you had women living right next door to their infants so that they could nurse them. But of course, there's a price to be paid because these young women, primarily, all in, in these institutions as, as a way of you know, helping to pay for their keep, right? So they also had virtually no freedom. They were living in what were effectively dormitories. Their job was to work in the wards and feed their children. But what this meant for the Children's Home of Winnipeg was they really switched their focus from infants to somewhat older children. And as, as I start looking at them as they're dealing with, with somewhat older children, and I read all of the, you know, all the standard materials they had, all their annual reports, all this, but then once I got access to the interior reports and the executive board reports and the records of, of family, the records of children, I was just blown away because I'm starting to see, first of all, these patterns of families who are coming and going. In some cases, I came across families that utilized the children's home three or four different times. But I was also struck by, remember I mentioned how there had been very little in the way of legislation early on? The older children, and once, when you're aging out, and once again, that changes over time, right? So at one point it's 12, later on it's 14, later it'll be 16. As they're aging out, where are these kids going to go? Well, you're going to try to find work for them, aren't you? The single largest category of employment for women in Winnipeg and most other places at this time was domestic labor. And so you're going to try to get these, the young women in particular, into positions where they'll be able to be, they'll serve as a domestic. And of course, the other argument is not only is this a, you know, a, a standard job for women, but of course it will train them for their future lives as wives and mothers. As time goes by, the children's home, their, their primary goal 
if they couldn't reunite a family, and they always wanted families to be reunited, but if they couldn't reunite the family, then they wanted to put, and I'm, gonna, I'm focusing on young women because very early on, the children's home made, I think, a very smart decision. They would take boys and girls, but it was really a good idea to separate the genders by about ages nine, 10. I've looked at all of the internal records. There is not a single instance of sexual abuse. And I mean, these records are detailed, right? I have seen all sorts of records about the incest that went on back in some of the homes, things like this. Not a single instance of sexual abuse. Well, you've separated the boys from the girls. And the other thing is that this institution, it focused, it did have some boys as they were younger, but then the focus, especially for older girls, was on girls. They were, I don't want to say cosseted, but they were protected from certain things. And this brings me to another crucial point that I want everyone to appreciate. This is one of the things I love most about the children's home. It was completely and utterly female dominated. Now, those of you who know anything about the era of the social gospel and you know, the, the settlement house work, and you'll know that in, in many cases, or almost every case, the vast majority of the work was being done by women. But there was quite often a titular male or there'd be some sort of male domination. Not the children's home. The children's home of Winnipeg, uh, every, well, I'll impress you with my incredible memory. I can name each and every single male director of the children's home of Winnipeg, because there were two of them. They lasted for a grand total of 18 months between the two of them. And they had more or less been forced upon the children's home of Winnipeg as this move towards professionalization, right? They've lost a great long-term director. And when she had to be replaced, the experts, J.J. Kelso, Canada's dean of all child rescue stuff, so well, you should have this guy. He'll be great. He lasts six months. At double the price paid for any of the female leaders. And then, he's a washout. They bring in a replacement. He lasts for about a year. And Along with him comes his wife. So not only are they paying him double, they're paying his wife the same salary they've been paying to the previous female superintendent, and they were a washout. Aside from those two, this whole period, 1883 until 1945, it is every single paid leadership position is a woman. But perhaps even more importantly, the board of directors Completely female. Men need not apply. Men were allowed, allowed to be on the advisory committee, only if your wife was one of the directors. Oh, and they were allowed to be on the fundraising committee. Because here's the thing. The women who were the backbone, the voluntary backbone of the Children's Home of Winnipeg, they were let's just say, well-to-do. They were well-married. Leah, if you want to switch to the next slide. This is a home. This is a, I'm, I'm sorry, it's spelled you know, Canadian. Uh, there's an extra U there. Uh, but this is from, uh, from Crescentwood. Flip to the next slide. This is Wellington Crescent. These are the sorts of homes that the women who were on the board of the Children's Home of Winnipeg were living in. Go to the next slide. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is Armstrong's point, right? Uh, these are incredibly well-to-do and well-connected women, right? Their husbands are sort of the business elite of Winnipeg, professional and business elite. Now, anyone who's ever done any work on the relations of rescue when it comes to, you know, voluntary groups in particular, helping people who are struggling, unwed mothers, you know, unemployed or underemployed workers and their families. We know to expect a certain amount of, shall we say, condescension. And why can't you be more like us? Why can't you be more respectable? How many times did I come across in the files the words of someone from the home talking to one of the unwed mothers we hope that you'll go on the straight line. Straight line. There is that. There's no question. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. 
there is, why can't you be more like us? Why can't you be more respectful? Why can't you act like members of the middle class, particularly the upper middle class? But going through all these records, I also developed not just a soft spot, but a profound admiration for a number of these women. Now, once again, if you're living in places like this, okay, your life might be pretty good, right? And it is, there's no question. If you're living in Armstrong's Point uh, or on Wellington Crescent, you're doing very well for yourself. My favorite directress, and I have my favorite directress of the board of directors, long-serving directress from, from the late teens until the 1930s, Louis Phillips. And I can't tell you how hard it was for me to find out her name because she was always just Mrs. Hugh Phillips. Those of us who are historians recognize that it's a, it can be hard to even get to the first names of women, right? But Louis Phillips was a force of frickin' nature. This woman, and of course I, I've gone through so many of her memos and things like this, she would pick up the phone once, you know, once, the, the, once the home had, and her period they, they always had phones. She'd pick up the phone and then she'd have to leave a little memo about what she'd done, right? And it was like, she called Chris. I'm going, oh, what was this? Because one, one of the kids had been in a little bit of trouble. Chris is Winnipeg's chief of police. Chris Newton. Okay, you know, it took me about 10 minutes to figure out who this is. I'm, I'm a historian of Winnipeg. Uh, she, if she had, not for her girls, now she was also a force of nature in finding good places for her girls to go, decent homes where they could work. And she would just be calling in. And if a family, if there was a chance that a family could be reunited and the children could go back to it, if only the husband could get his job back, he'd been laid off. <laughs> She's on the phone to the district manager of the Canadian Pacific Railway, because he'd been working in the rail shops. And nine times out of 10, that dude was rehired. It's because we know, I know this only because I see that the family was able to, there's actually a note. Got his job back, family reunited. These are remarkable insights. Other things, and I'm not gonna to try to give you the entire history of what I've, been, what I've been doing with this, but I want you to have some understanding of how exciting it is for a historian to come across records like this. Because in the records that the Children's Home of Winnipeg kept, they had what were, what were called the record of child, right? And it's this background data on the family or on the, the mother who has to, the unwed mother who has to put her child in the home. And it shows me, or it shows the historian, okay, no, it shows me because you folks don't have a research agreement, you're not allowed to go see this. Um, it shows me exactly what the family was making, where it lived, not only what part of the city of Winnipeg, how much it cost them for rent, because they need to have detailed information to decide who is worthy and who isn't. Because they only have so much money, right? Even with the incredible fundraising abilities that these women had, they only had so much that they could do and so much capacity. They had to determine who was worthy. And it's an internal, internal body from the board of directors. The executive management committee met every Wednesday afternoon to hear cases asking for application. And they needed all this information and they kept it all. As a historian, especially as a social historian, I can't tell you how many times I have cited data that I can pull quite easily, and it's great data. It comes from census information, it comes from Stats Canada. Stats Canada wouldn't lie to me. Sorry, Stats Canada is just the name for the big government agency in Canada that, that handles all of these sort of, of numbers and records. And I can tell you exactly how much you were supposed to make in every category of work in Winnipeg from, 19, well, no, from 1891 until the 1940s. I can cite for any given year pretty much how much an electrician was making, how much a plumber was making, how much every, every group was making. Except I'm looking at these records and people who know that they're gonna be checked up on have to say exactly how much money you were making. And you know what happened? It doesn't jive with the official numbers. What I found, and particularly once again, remember I mentioned one of the single largest categories of employment for women, especially younger women, was domestic labor. Now when I look at the stats can numbers, I can tell you how much a domestic worker was getting per week. I don't think I found a single case of a woman who was working as a domestic worker and had her child or children in the home 
when she was making that much money a week. In fact, I have cases that stretch from the 1890s, okay, so I'm not talking just about the depression of the 1930s, because okay, so my work goes up throughout the 1930s, and you can expect horrendous economic circumstances in the 1930s, right? But in the 1890s, the 1900s, the 1910s, the 1920s, and of course the 1930s, I can show you evidence of women who were working as domestics for no pay whatsoever. They're room and board. They're room and board. If they were getting paid, quite often it would be $5 a month. <clears throat> you know what really kills me? And this is, this is where I'm just going to admit, doing this work on the children's home, I'm being very professional. I am. And of course, all of the records that I'm keeping, at one point, after I finish writing everything up, I have to destroy it all. I've already told my son that if I drop, because Mary's not going to handle it, if I drop dead tomorrow, he has to destroy <laughs> all of those card notes and three different computer drives because none of this material could go out into the public. I mean, I need it as long as I'm working on it, right? But it, it contains sensitive data. So I'm being very professional. But on the other hand, I'm being incredibly unprofessional. Can we flip forward? Now here's Winnipeg in 1907, this growing city. Now just imagine, remember I showed you that picture of you know, the immigration shed in 1884, sort of that sleepy little town? That's what Winnipeg looks like in 1907. It's growing like Topsy. You know, next slide. This dude is one of the wealthiest men in Winnipeg. Long before the turn of the 20th century, he was acknowledged to be a millionaire. I know that doesn't impress anyone nowadays. Maybe this crowd has a little bit more appreciation. When I tell my students someone's a millionaire, they go, yeah. You know, I say a billion dollars, they go, huh, yeah. You know, it's like... But I, I think to us, we can understand that someone at the turn of the century to be a millionaire, this was huge. He was Western Canada's commercial and not manufacturing, but merchandising king. He had a finger in so many pots. He is also one of the leading benefactors of the Children's Home of Winnipeg. This gentleman, personally, and if we go down to the next slide, this is the new building. That's, they, they move into it in 1915, or they start building 15 and it's completed in 16. Now look, at this is a press photo, so that's why you can see children in it. They move out to this luxurious new suburb of Winnipeg. Well, that's the plan. It's going to be a luxurious new suburb, but it hasn't really taken off yet. There's a little economic downturn just before the Great War. And so the developer gave the children's home the land for free. And then the fellow I just showed you, Sandy McDonald, contributed $50,000 personally out of the overall $125,000 that it took to build this. State-of-the-art child care. It's going to be able to handle hundreds of children every year. If we go to the next slide, this is the actual footprint of it. This is, I, I love fire insurance maps, right? Because you can actually see there's the core building, the outbuilding, its own school on premise. Now, the school is going to be staffed by City of Winnipeg teachers and principal. All, by the way, did I mention? All women. I just want to go back to this point one more time. Of every salaried position in the Children's Home of Winnipeg, aside from that, that brief, unhappy experiment with, with the male superintendent, throughout the entire period, there is one male employee. His job? Boiler maintenance work. <laughs> Some stereotypes hold true, right? But seriously, there's not a single, and many, many folks will probably know that one of the best paid semi or skilled positions uh, that, that you would find in many working class areas, but particularly amongst women, is that of cook. The cook at the children's home was always a woman. There was no male chef there ever. It was always women. And that is, it was a pretty good paying position, right? Well, this place could house over 200 children and it had staff facilities, live-in facilities. Everyone who worked there lived there for up to 40 people incredible staff to child ratio, right? Just absolutely remarkable. Now, let's go to the next slide. This is its own purpose-built school. It's just been restored. It's now been, it's being used for, for another, another purpose. But that was the school that was on site. That's how big this institution became. 
And now I want to talk a little bit more about some of these women. Go to the next slide. Lizzie Proctor. She was superintendent of the Children's Home of Winnipeg from 1911 till 1918. So she supervised the move out to, the, to, to this new facility, right? And the building of it and helped with the fundraising. Sandy McDonald was a big fan of hers. Sandy McDonald, by the way, didn't just give money. He came out to the Children's Home every single Sunday during regular visiting hours and gave candy and fruit to all the children. He was very, very hands-on. And what's amazing is, not only was he a major benefactor of the Children's Home of Winnipeg, many years after the Children's Home got established, another non-denominational group set up a child-caring institution, and it was called the Home of the Friendless. He was its major benefactor as well. If I'd, if I'd thought about it, that school that you saw is actually named the Julia Child, not, not that Julia Child, uh, but the Julia Child School. It was named after a woman who had been the longtime directress, or not directress, but from the board of directors. She'd never had a child, and she dedicated almost all of her waking hours to the Children's Home of Winnipeg. She was just amazing. Um, but this woman only resigns as the, as the superintendent to take on the most interesting position that you could have imagined. She becomes Manitoba's first female probation officer working with the young women and girls who've gotten into some sort of trouble with the law. She's on the cutting edge of, of all these changes. But then, can we go to the next slide? And this is the height of my lack of professionalism. This is Phoebe Ramsey. I fell in love with her. I know you should never say you fell in love with another woman right in front of your, your wife, but I did. Of course, she's long dead, so it's pretty safe. This woman is remarkable. After that, remember I mentioned the failed experiment of the two guys? Well, the board hired her. She is, uh, she blows me away just thinking about her. She's a Scot by birth, but she was actually born in Russia because her father was a, was a Scottish uh, mining engineer and he'd been in Russia at the time working, so she's born there. Her training is impeccable. She's going to go on. She, she actually uh, trains, in, and, and uh, as most of you probably know at the time, a nurse would have received their graduate training in a hospital setting, right? It was not a strictly academic program. So she trained at, at Glasgow's major hospital. She went on to become the, and of course, it's the, the head sister right, in, in, uh, of a major British hospital, the nursing side of it. She served in several different capacities in, in England. But, but this is the kicker. She was also an incredibly talented pianist. She actually was a fellow of the, of the, uh, of, of the Royal Society of London. She played professionally as an accompanist, uh, as, a, as a pianist, with the Moscow Symphony Orchestra on a couple of different occasions. She was just this phenomenal woman. And she's hired to become the head of the Children's Home of Winnipeg at half the price of that last guy who just washed out. She was phenomenal. Why do I call her an innovator? Well, because when I read the annual report from the first year that she had taken over as directress, or sorry, as, as the superintendent, there's a very short director's report in the annual report that goes out to the public. And I kept on thinking, I wonder what regular folks are gonna think when they read this, because other people on the board of directors would have already seen it. But she announced, this is 1921, she announced that the health of the children was particularly good this year. She was so happy about it, and she felt that a big part of it was because they'd done away entirely with the practice of corporal punishment. What, let me just say, 1921, no corporal punishment. Now, I'm sure you folks never ever got in any trouble. But when I was growing up in the 1960s and 1970s in Winnipeg, the same city that she was in, uh, you could get called down to the office. And in true Canadian fashion, our strap was made from a beaver tail. Uh, you know, we, we, we like to contribute to stereotypes in many ways. Um, she says in 1921, no corporal punishment. I defy you to find me a child caring institution or any place that acts in loco parentis. I'm sure that maybe one or two others do exist, but I haven't found them. This is remarkable. It's 
so I'm thinking, you know, like, what are some of the people who are reading the report going, what? And she got it through the board. It was actually part of the terms of her employment. She was going to do this. Now, you know, it's one thing to say you have a policy. It's something else to actually enforce it. Now, Phoebe Ramsey is phenomenally successful. Really, really good. And the board loves her. And Mrs. Mrs. Hugh Louis Phillips is clearly a big supporter of her, right? And when the, when the elected first directress, who really has power, when she's in your corner, you know, you're, you're in good shape. And they loved her so much that every year she was given a month's leave with pay. This, folks, is a big deal, you know, from the, well, from after about four or five years. This is huge, right? And she'd go back to the old country, spend time with family. And this is how I know her rhetoric was real. She get, came back and found out that the assistant superintendent, uh, not using any names, had allegedly struck a child. She gave that person a warning. The next year, that person was no longer with the children's home. And in the annual report that goes out to the public, so-and-so announces their resignation. Resignation. I go into the executive minutes that are not open to the public, and she was fired because she'd lost her temper yet again. She'd been given one chance, she lost her temper, she hit a child, and that was it. She was gone. And this is something that, the reason I, I focus on this is because it's so remarkable to me. You know, I can cite you chapter and verse on all the child legislation, all the changes that were going on in these relations of rescue, right? And how these, how this place, how the children's home was supposed to be working. But you know, the difference between laws and formal policy and practice are huge. And so when I see a policy like that, I think the policy is lovely, but then to see it actually in action is remarkable to me. But here's the other thing. I want to go back to this difference between policy and practice. The records of the children's home, and this is, once again, this is, sorry, historians being nerdy. There's a moment as I'm going through these records. Now, my period of greatest interest is from, it's the interwar period, but as a baseline here, I want to establish things before the, the Great War. So I focus a lot from 1913 all the way through to 1949, 1940. As I'm going through the records, 1913, remember I mentioned those things called the record of child. That's where a lot of this data was kept. And there would always be some uh, goodly bunch of material in these files. And then all of a sudden, I start getting the occasional pink sheet of paper. What the heck is this? And I realized that it comes from a much later period, but it's been because every child's file was started the day they, that they got involved. So if you had a child who was actually involved with the home for over a decade, you would have stuff that that would be in their file from the 1920s, even in the 19-teens. And then, I finally figured out after about, after I started seeing more of these pink pages showing up, and they were so much more detailed, and so much background. And oh my goodness, included were excerpts from police courts, from the Children's Aid Society of Winnipeg, from all these agencies I hadn't come across yet. Well, what happens? In 1924, there is this major change in legislation, and there's a, a new type of, of funding model, the Federated Board, and a new agency called the Children's Bureau of Winnipeg is established. It's a clearinghouse for all information, all this great stuff. Well now, in the record of every single child, as you go further along, you're gonna get these pink sheets. In some cases, they're reports that are 25 to 30 pages long. And this is the kicker. They not only have investigative reports, reports from all of these different sources, government sources, but quite often you'll have the social workers themselves quoting the women and the children, and sometimes the husbands, uh, on their interests. We actually start to have some of the voices come through of these people, of poor people who were forced by circumstances to give their children up, or you know, whatever the circumstances were. And if you're a social historian, to actually get the voices, that now once again they've run through the lens and the typewriter of a social worker. These are, like it's small font, single spaced, 
But you know, the great thing is, every single social worker, because these reports are going through the hands of many different people, right? Everyone who contributed to it, initialed it. Well, if you're a half decent historian, after a little while, you can figure out who is who from the different social agencies, and you know their initials, and you get to know who is hardline and who isn't. But this is, this is what, aside from being part of the art of the historian, what this really does for me is it lets me also see the changes, not only in the official policies and legislation about childcare and about you know, family welfare in general, but it also shows me the way that the interactions between clients and professionals actually work. Remember I mentioned early on, it's kind of easy to assume that all the people involved in this are sort of upper middle class and they're looking down their noses a little at, at these folks. As I'm reading these files, what I kept on coming across, and once again, it's almost all women who are involved in the, in the not all, but largely women involved in the Children's Bureau, things like this. I found them helping these, especially the young women who, who were unwed, I found them helping them to find ways to dodge the question of their marital status. Really easy in the years immediately after World War I. My husband, just, dear, just tell them that you were married and your husband died in the war. Who's not going to believe you? In the Winnipeg of 1919, 1920, 1921, 1922, we had horrendous losses, right? I mean, you folks probably don't know this, but Canada had a really, really high attrition rate in, in the Great War. Uh, there were over 65,000 Canadian losses. You know, if you think about it, Canada had a population of 8 million. It had 500,000 people serve in the Canadian Expeditionary Force. It's a huge percentage of the population. And of course, this is a war of attrition. So all sorts of people didn't come home or die shortly after. It's a great dodge. But it's not just coaching these women on how they can restart their lives. But it also shows you that, that these social workers are not just, you know, we think they're all going to have these 19th century Victorian attitudes and they're going to always be condemnatory, right, about anyone who's not living the sort of life that they are. They're actively trying to help these folks get their lives back together. And yes, they, do, they, they would like these people to be a little bit more like themselves. But this woman in particular, she honestly seems not to have made judgments. Just tell you, that I can't give you the name here. But there was a young woman who came to the children's home the first time long before she was there. She had been in a highly dysfunctional family. She ends up being allowed to go and be some man's housekeeper. Surprise, surprise, she ends up being pregnant. The first child comes to the children's home of Winnipeg, and she eventually gives it up for adoption, right? Signs, signs it away. She's put back into that same situation, ends up having another child. And meanwhile, her, her family, the, the family she came from, has been coming apart at the seams, and she has siblings who are ending up in the children's home of Winnipeg. She comes back with a second child. What does the children's home of Winnipeg do? taken her child and hire her. She worked there for over 10 years, became a much valued employee, and in every single piece of correspondence, every reference to this woman, I can't tell you her name, but in every single reference, how she referred to? Mrs. Mrs. Everyone in a position of who was writing those reports, everyone on the executive of the board, knew her, knew her whole family story, but it was always Mrs. So-and-so. That may seem like a little thing, okay? But it's not. When you read the accounts of the way people were being viewed, the way they were being treated, and once again, you know, sometimes you, you want to hate some of the bureaucrats who seem to be hard line, but you know, people from the children's home, but also the people from that children's bureau, which becomes part of the, the bureaucracy. The children's home, which had started as an independent agency, becomes caught up in this public-private partnership, if you will. And they're gonna to have to follow a lot more rules. This work is teaching me so much. It is, this is education 101 for a historian, especially a social historian. And I'm forever grateful that I made the mistake of deciding to go down this rabbit hole. Why do I call it a mistake? Because 
Each and every record that I've decided, aside from the public records, each and every record that I've cited for you, of course, is part, remember that research agreement I had to sign? I can't release things. I also can't photocopy anything. I can't scan anything. I could not use a graduate teaching assistant to help me conduct any of this research. And the tens of thousands of pages of these records, I have to read personally, make handwritten notes on, there are no shortcuts. And so yes, it's, it is time consuming. Is this going to make the book on Winnipeg better? I sure hope so. But it's also going to lead to a book on the children's home, but all the larger relations of rescue, because I've just, I, okay, I didn't read it to you. I've got 35 pages for the paper I was gonna give today. Thought I'd, thought I'd give you a break. Um, I have all sorts of detailed information, and I've only harnessed a part of it. I'm also gonna create a database that I'll be able to make available to other historians because all the names will be removed, right? I'll be able to give a breakdown. And this is, in some ways, just the way historians work. And so, I, I don't want to go into any more great detail. I've kept your attention for far, far too, I'm sorry, a full hour now. Um, but I would like to throw it open if, if anyone has any questions. I don't blame if you don't, but... Yes. Yeah. I'm wondering about, uh, you mentioned uh, North Winnipeg several times at the beginning. How far is that away from the city center? I know Winnipeg to the extent I've been asking down right. Port each a bunch of times. <laughs> the, two, depending on, well, from, <laughs> from that, that place, that where I showed you on the map, right? Yes. That, the north end of Winnipeg really starts less than a mile away okay. from, or about a mile away from Winnipeg, right? Because, yeah, Mayor, if you go from the tracks down to Corner Porridge in Maine, it's a little over a mile. So that is really not that far from the heart of the city, but back in the day when public transportation was sort of weak, that was a huge dividing line. And we didn't have, you know, Winnipeg is a city of bridges. Several of them crossed over that rail yard. Yes. Yes, when, when uh, about what point in time did the children's hospital, or children's home, I mean, disappear? Mm. What the reasons why? Okay. And actually, thank you very much for that question. It's something I should have mentioned. Remember I mentioned there were changes in policies, changes in, in attitudes. One of the things that even at the close of the 19th century, you're starting to have experts saying, no child should ever be in an institution like this. The way to go is to put everyone into foster care immediately. The children's home, and it's Louis Phillips, this director I've described, and Phoebe Ramsey, they're just, no, you know, we realize we want every family to be reunited. We want children to be in homes, but not every home should have a child. And their fear, and Louis Phillips was really blunt about this, there will be people who will foster children for the money, not for the love of the child. And I think anyone who's seen some of the foster arrangements that have worked out over time, they weren't necessarily wrong. And one of the biggest, remember I mentioned they were always trying to, to place children. One of the things they always worried about, and the, <laughs> both the directress and the superintendent are incredibly good on this, they worried whenever anyone asked for an older girl Yeah, what were they looking for? And this is their language, looking for a drudge. Someone who would be free labor. Seriously, that was, that was a great concern. You know, some, depending on the audience I'm talking to, right? Some will go, oh, it's a sexual thing. No, it's about unpaid labor. And at the children's home, one of the things that they did, and this is, once again, remember these are well-to-do women, right? Who are, who are on the board of directors. They actually had people who were elected to the position of visitor. And aside from visiting the home, they actually would go and visit the places, the situations where these girls were. As we go further along in time, and you're supposed to go to school longer, or the goal becomes to go to school longer, they, they refer to it as the, uh, uh, the boarding while in school option, right? And so these girls are supposed to be able to keep going to school, maybe go to high school. That'd be cool. While they're doing a little, a little bit of mother's helper work. But you kept a close eye on those, very close eye. Um, the dedication of, of these women, and Phoebe Ramsey, tucked away, she didn't keep a separate file for letters of love and admiration. You just find them sort of tucked away every so often. It'll be it's some, some girl's file, right, and you're reading it, and then you'll see that Miss Ramsey had tucked away these letters, and it's like, oh, I've never forgotten you. You've been so important in my life. How is so-and-so doing? And checking on all these folks, she created a completely different atmosphere. This is, uh, once again, I've made the unforgivable mistake of falling in love with her. 
because she was humane. She was human. Um, and you know, you don't want to assume the worst of people, but you do know that there are horror stories. Because I've also looked into the, the reports that have come out from many others. One place I mentioned in particular, the home of the friendless, it had to be shut down in 1927 amidst a major scandal about the way the children were being treated, the, the conditions, all this sort of stuff, right? And other, other institutions throughout Winnipeg, um, I mean, Winnipeg had such, talk about a plethora of institutions. By the 1920s, folks, you had not just like a place like the children's home, but of course, St. Boniface, and you saw on that map, St. Boniface was at the time still a separate city, right? Well, of course, it had its own children aid society. It had its own Catholic institutions, primarily Catholic. You had institutions run, the Jewish community in Winnipeg, actually the historian of, of, the, of the, children's, the Jewish children's home was a friend of mine, and we compare notes all the time. And these, these institutions all had their own childcare institutions, including by the late 1920s, there was an institution, an old folks home and combined old folks home and orphanage for the left-wing Ukrainian community. Just the left-wing Ukrainians, not the other left-wing group, just the Ukrainians. So you had this incredible plethora of different groups, and I've never come across a single one that was as well-run, as compassionate, and literally as much loved as this one. But to go back to that question, the larger philosophy meant that the children's home by the 1930s was a dinosaur. It was a place that could house up to 300 people at a time when everyone was saying, no, you foster all the children out. Just to, and those of you who, who, who are as much nerds as I am, you'll love this. Those early, ado the adoptions that the children's home used to do from 1883 until 1924 when there's major change in, in Manitoba's child welfare legislation and adoption legislation, those children were sent out. They were actually still legally, not the property, but the wards of the children's home. And they went out to their foster parents on indentures an indenture. I, I just love that. And one of the terms of the indenture, every foster parent had to put $5 a year into a fund for that child. And when they turned 18, that money had to be turned over to them as just sort of some way to get them started, right? Now, of course, I've been giving you some of the positive. I have to tell you as well that as a parent, now a grandparent, uh, when I go into the archives and I'm reading these detailed files, and I mentioned some of them were 25, 30 pages long, some of them are pretty horrendous. Not about what's happened to the children home, but about what happened to them outside, about their family lives, their circumstances. And you almost have to make a deal with yourself that you're never going to think about your own family when you're going through some of these records. But it is such an incredible source to try to understand the way people really live their lives. And as I say, Things like challenging the data, the official data on, on, on wages, things like that, the way people really live, uh, is to me really important. Right. Any other questions? Yes? How are the Métis represented? Not at all. Thank you. Great question. Because, now I've, I've been showing these folks as the most enlightened you're going to come across, right? Because there were, okay, and once again, just not to be, not to nerd out here, but in Canadian terms, when we use the term Métis, we tend to be referring to the French and native mixed blood. Those folks are all, almost all Roman Catholic, so they're all over, they'll be dealt with in St. Boniface by, by these child care agencies. But you're actually raising, I think, another question. There's another group of mixed bloods. Well, exactly. The Scots, and, well, Scots, English, and, and native, right? And the thing is, nowadays, politically, those groups are now all referred to in Canadian terms as Métis. And there's a, there's a political reasoning for all of this, right? I won't go into that. But that group were, used to be referred to traditionally as the mixed blood or the country born. The only time I've come across anything close to racist language in Children's Home of Winnipeg records would be a note, this, woman, this mother was half-breed. And it wasn't written with affection. It, it seemed to be not just a descriptor. Uh, those of you who know Winnipeg well will know that Winnipeg has a problem with First Nations uh, white relations. It's, it, it, it's still there. Um, as a proud Winnipegger, I can't deny it. It's, it's there. It's, it was there when I was a kid. It's still there now. 
But that, that is the one case. And we do see a number of people who would be mixed blood but not described as Métis because they weren't French because the French tended to be Roman Catholic. And that's the other thing. I, one, of the, one of the documents that I came across was there was a little in-house history. Almost every institution that has any sort of length of time um, and professionals running it will, will generate at some point an in-house history. And the, uh, the in-house history proudly cited that you know, after 1915, the children's home of Winnipeg began taking in children of all backgrounds. Yeah, there were at least six. <laughs> Seriously, it was like they would have a reference from the from now the the the, the government-run Children's Aid Society of Winnipeg saying, "Can you take these in?" And they go, "Well, you know, they're not Protestant. If you need it for an emergency basis, we'll take these in." A couple of cases where people with names like mine, I'm going, "Oh, they did start taking people in," and then I realize, "Oh no, those are the folks who converted to Protestantism," and. That's pretty rare amongst Eastern Europeans, right? So there's, there is still this religious sort of thing. But I will also say that while the Jewish children's home of Western Canada was being built, those children, for the most part, ended up going to the children's home of Winnipeg. They had a really positive relationship with the, with the Jewish community on, on some of these matters. Um, so there are all of these different permutations, um, and it's, it's a source of never-ending wonder to me. And I'm really pleased I've just worked out a deal that I'm gonna actually have some time to finish off my, because I, I literally need seven to eight months of solid archival time to finish off these records. And I worked out a deal, I'm gonna get it. So, 